You're listening to the Successors Podcast with Kara Oosterhuis on realagriculture.com. Okay, folks, it's time for episode four of the Successors Podcast. I'm your host, Kara Oosterhuis, and as always, I'm so excited to be here with you all, wherever or however you are listening. You guys, I have no idea how it is September already, and not even just September, but the end of September. I'm looking out my window right now. It's a gorgeous fall day. However, the leaves are falling, everything's turning, and it can't help. I can't help but kind of think, oh no, it is going to be cold in winter before we know it. But uh, hey, we are working on focusing on the here and now. Speaking of the here and now, I'm going to bring in today's guest here. I have with me David McTaggart, who is a master's student at the University of Saskatchewan based at Saskatoon. How are things going there today, David? I'm doing well. I'm uh, appreciating the rain that we've gotten recently in Saskatoon. I know it's uh, harvest time here for all the crop farmers, but uh, as a forage guy myself, I think rain almost at any time of the year is appreciated. I'm taking it as it comes. (laughs) And as I said, you're based at Saskatoon. Born and raised in the area, or where are you from originally? No, I'm not. I uh, grew up on a small hobby farm just east of Lacombe, Alberta. Uh, is where I grew up for most of my uh, childhood and teenage years. And so I've been in Saskatoon since 2016 to do my undergrad and then my master's since then. Okay, so you're currently working on your master's right now. Yes, yes, I am. I uh, started that uh, in the spring of 2020. And so we're about three quarters of the way through my uh, second summer of data collection. So It's been, uh, yeah, definitely a good adventure so far. So I'm in forage breeding, and so uh, kind of there's two components. Uh, The first one is trying to figure out what uh, can be the benefits for using drones in forage breeding to help save breeders time by um, screening larger areas in a shorter amount of time and money so we can use those resources that farmers provide to us, to our research programs more effectively. And then the second portion is uh, what the actual breeding project we're working on is uh, developing new varieties for what's called stockpile grazing. And so that's uh, perennial forages that will keep their quality and will have a high yield in the fall and early winter to help save farmers money and then also to uh, improve the environmental impacts of uh, beef and livestock production. That is super fascinating. So what kind of, I mean, I know many undergrads, if they're deciding to go on and get their master's, it's it's tough figuring out what you want to focus on specifically. What was that process like for you? Yes, you definitely hit the nail on the head there, Kara. Um, uh, yeah, no, I looked at, when I first came into my undergrad, I definitely thought I wanted to be in more in field crops. Um, you know, I think first year Dave probably thought he wanted to be a corn breeder among thousands of other corn breeders. Um, and I guess it was in third year that I took a uh, grassland management course from the gentleman who's now my supervisor. And I just like the uh, sp- space of working in forages. First, I grew up on a small beef farm, uh, so that connection to animals was always there. But also, it's a, it's a way to that you can connect the different disciplines in uh in agriculture of you know i've my educational background is definitely in plants and crops but you get to tie in the animal aspect and you get to tie in the soil health and things like that too i'm drawing on my table right now doing hand gestures um but (laughs) that's being able to work with many different parties was something that really drew me to wanting to to work in the forage space And you grew up in the 4-H space as well, so I can imagine you were surrounded by animals in that area as well. Was that a driver in any of your decisions? Yeah, absolutely. So I usually, when I'm chatting about these types of things, um, the things that convinced me that I wanted to to pursue a career in agriculture were um, my mom comes from a a farm family background. They've uh, been farming in Alberta for about 100 and just shy of 110 years now um and so the, having that experience of being able to work on my extended family's farm growing up was showed me that it was a way of life that i really enjoyed and yeah and then the second portion was definitely 4-h so i was in beef 4-h for eight years and then gardening 
uh, 4-H for one year and definitely introduced me to a larger community of the people that I really appreciated in the agriculture industry and that um, spirit of working with young people as well to get them interested about whatever different aspects of agriculture. And that's something that I wanted to continue to do. Um, And so, yeah, those are some of the things that kind of brought me here. Okay, and we're definitely going to get back to that. However, I I have to stop and ask you, gardening 4-H, that's not something that I have necessarily heard of. Maybe, maybe it is more popular than I'm aware of, but uh, can you elaborate on what gardening 4-H is? What was that like? <laughs> yeah, no, so that's, that's just fine. I, there's not many gardening clubs in uh, 4-H Alberta. So uh, this came about after my first year of university. I was, um, I came through my first year and I had, I kind of did the opposite of what a lot of students go to when they come, do when they come to university of, uh, instead of really experiencing the nightlife of what university had to offer, I spent a lot of my first year doing schoolwork and, uh, you know, I was great, but I finished the year and I was kind of feeling the need to do something more, get involved with my community and so my mom and I started bouncing some ideas around and we decided to start a gardening 4-H club or a gardening 4-H project in my hometown of Lacombe. And uh, so it was a summer project. And so it's a, you know, a less of a time commitment than something like beef that stretches over eight, nine months. And um, also with the gardening aspect, it opened up uh, to be able to engage not just members who are already in 4-H, but people from more of an urban background as well, because it was a type of thing that uh, many different people could participate in. And so, yeah, we ran this project for two years, um, and I was a leader for the first year and a member for the second. And it was it was a lot of fun. I think we had um, different kind of parts of it. The, the first part, we had our projects. Um, and so members chose anything. If they had the space for a garden, we did that, but also we had container gardening. And then they prepared those projects to show. The first year, it was uh, during Canada's 150th anniversary, and so we had a big uh, county fair for that. And so we displayed those things there. And then this, um, another portion was we also worked with um, caring for the garden at the Lacombe Long-Term Care Facility as well where my mom's a nurse. And so uh, having kind of that community service aspect tied in. So it was, it was a lot of fun. Definitely put, uh, took a lot of hours to put the project together, but it was really rewarding. Were you able to attract some urban members as well? We were. Yeah. You know, I think um, we had a total of probably 16 or 18 members and then using some of our connections in the community through, um, mom's work and then also our church community and things like that uh we were able to bring in some new members and it was it was different you know and it took a little bit of extra time and care right because with the members who had already been in 4-h they knew each other they had their you know social circles established and so as leaders we needed to be a little bit more deliberate in making sure our new members could uh connect in and and uh, make friends and things like that. But I think definitely by the end of the second year, you could see that they had started to enjoy it because they, they found something where they could really express their, their interests. For some people, you know, with young kids, we always tried to have food involved in every <laughs> single one of our events. And the eating part of it was great. And some of the members found out that they really liked cooking afterwards or floral arrangements or those types of things. And so it was trying to, with our newer members from urban areas, um, making sure that they had, we helped them build that community um, was something that I found helped to make it more of a success. Oh, and I mean, I don't think it is just kids that are motivated by food. I don't know if you've ever been to a good field day, but if the food is good, there seems to be some direct correlation to how long people stick around. We are oh, motivated. <laughs> if uh, I'm, I'm definitely a person who jumps on that bang. Like, I remember going to 4-H events too. And yeah, the, the luncheon that was a part of it, could make or break an event. I'm, I'm telling you, there was, uh, yeah, I always appreciated that when there was, uh, I did a lot of public speaking too. And maybe the, I, I'll, I'll credit some of the, 
the good luck I had to the fact that I had a good lunch at the end of a public speaking competition to motivate me to the end. <laughs> so like you said, you were looking to sort of find your place and found the help within a club. Now, do you have any suggestions for someone who is looking to follow their passion in the same sort of way you did? Yeah, no, I think that's that's a that's a good and tough question. Um, I would say some of my suggestions would be you need a team. That's um, first and foremost, you know, because especially with these, if you if you have an idea and you want to build it, but there's not necessarily the system there yet. Um, that's a lot of work. It's uh, but it's it's worth it. Um, and I found that having other people around you to help in that process and who can share in different aspects of your dream. Like you don't have to have the same vision, but so say for our gardening project. um, So my, my role in it was planning some of our events uh, and also being able to design the program itself. So some of the, the, in the background activities, but we had some of our very experienced 4-H leaders from other types of projects. Uh, like beef and outdoors and um, the dog club as well, who are really good at working with the members. And so they help to actually um, conduct our workshops and uh, be able to um, be the people on the floor for like our achievement day and things like that. And so assembling a team with varied strengths, but you can all kind of share in the enthusiasm of why you're there, I would say would be my biggest suggestion for designing some new initiatives. I know earlier you had mentioned you were passionate about youth leadership as well. Now, obviously this ties into 4-H, but there are many other forms of leadership in this industry as well. When did you really discover that was something that you were interested in? Mm, that's, that's another good question. I would say it was probably in high school um, because I, I started, I was kind of coming into the position where I had been involved in the 4 H community, in addition to just agriculture as a whole for, for a little while. And I had some experience, still lots to learn, but some experience in the perspective of youth. And you, you start to be able to really, when, when you work with the people who are, say, oh, six, seven years younger than you just starting out in the program, maybe around that eight years old aspect, you start to see the enthusiasm and the gifts that they bring to their work. And you want to just be able to kind of foster it. So it, it grows into something um, and they can channel it to do some really neat things. And so I guess seeing that enthusiasm, talent, kindness, those types of things in, in the people younger than me, uh, I wanted to participate in making what they wanted to do a reality, whether that was uh, getting better at public speaking, whether that was uh, learning how to clip and fit a cow for achievement day, or even now, like uh, this summer when I was back home, some of our young 4-H members, I introduced them to uh, rotational grazing, and they just thought that moving fence was the best thing in the world. And I'm not sure if it was the moving fence part but, or like the frogs that we found in the pasture or the lemonade that we drank afterwards, but they liked the activity. And so, it was, uh, yeah, it, it can exist in lots of different scenarios. Well, you should send them my way uh, when I have my goats to move because, uh, I mean, don't get me wrong, I enjoy the livestock. I enjoy... Uh, I enjoy all these things, but man, when it is 39 degrees, I can tell you I do not feel like moving fence to move those goats around the pasture. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> maybe send them my way. <laughs> yes, I imagine goats are a different kettle of fish. I would like to learn more about that, to be honest. I've been looking at some of our brush that we have at home. It's like, oh, these cows just don't want to eat it, but maybe the goats would. I mean, maybe. They certainly do it. They do do a good job of cleaning up an area, that's for sure. But uh, definitely a learning experience over here too. So when it when it comes to leadership, did you find that there was anything unique to agriculture when it comes to these spaces and how kids are learning? Uh, the first thing that jumped into my mind was work ethic, but I'm I'm trying to think critically on that because I do think a strong work ethic can exist 
in people from other backgrounds and other industries too. Um, but a work ethic in building something that's very hands-on um, because, you know, I'm thinking since coming to university, you see lots of students who can study really hard and things like that to build knowledge and those types of things. But in the agriculture industry, I've seen with you that they're building something quite physical, um, whether that is, you know, growing in the garden where they start out to helping their uh, parents with equipment or livestock or that. And so it's something that, that that's quite tangible, I think, in, in the leaders that are, that are built up that way. And it also often involves people. I think that that's something that's special about the agriculture industry is that there's a lot of families involved in it. And so you start to see that in order to be successful you need good people on your side as well too and so i would say work ethic that is a collective effort to build something with that would kind of be in a roundabout way of explaining it what i would think would differentiate those leaders in, that are involved in the agriculture industry now on the topic of family did you grow up on the family farm yourself no so uh my mom is one of eight kids and so she, uh, she's a nurse and my, my dad's an engineer. And so I was born in Fort McMurray, actually. And then we moved down to Lacombe when I was two. And then we moved out to our acreage when I was six. And so uh, we just kind of started our, our own little hobby operation there. My sister and I built up a small herd through being involved in 4-H. Um, but since moving away to university and my oldest sister, you're working as an engineer now, um, we've sold our, our breeding herd, but uh, I help my parents. We, we graze yearling steers now and kind of uh, direct market beef to, to our friends and people in our community too. Now on the topic of importance of people, you've, you've sat on some boards as well as, like you said, uh, growing up, you've been involved with a few different things. Talk a bit more on the importance of people. I, I think that coming to university has a lot of extra extra opportunities that are exist beyond your classes um and definitely seen that a lot in graduate school that by attending field days sitting on committees like i'm a director on the saskatchewan forage council and the, the people that you meet from that really add on to all the things that you can learn i often hear young people asking how to get involved with a board and what that kind of process is like as a younger person talk about your experience there yeah, absolutely. So uh, I joined the Saskatchewan Forage Council. It was last July, I think, is when we had our AGM. And so definitely been a bit of a different year uh, for a first year on a board with all virtual meetings. I think I met, oh, three out of about 12 or 14 directors before the pandemic. And so there was a lot of catching up this summer of hello, I've just met you on web meetings and things like that, but it's been nice to, to finally connect with those folks. And so, um, anyways, the Saskatchewan Forge Council is an organization that works to advance and promote the forage industry in Saskatchewan. So there's a real variety of people on the board. Uh, so there's myself and others from the university and the research community, uh, a number of ranchers and farmers are involved in it too and then some folks from government as well um and so i guess some of the big things uh, i've learned so far is you know gained an appreciation for some of the skills that i can learn surrounding like board governance and things like that that actually help organizations to run well you know i think uh over this last year i've come to learn that uh and appreciate you know, communities and the organizations that help to run them, it takes a lot of work, right? And um, so the, I've been able to gain some of those skills around um, not just running meetings and things like that that I picked up in 4-H, but really working within big systems of like government grants and things like that. So it's been, I've really enjoyed it. And there's been some great events that we put together every year, like the uh, Saskatchewan Pasture Tour that we finished a few weeks ago. Um, that brought together producers, people from the, the Ministry of Agriculture and Agriculture Canada and that as well to, to talk about uh, pasture management. You know, it's a, it's a really 
uh, top thing uh, that's top of mind on a drought year like this. And um, so I think that the organization can really provide some value in that space. So as somebody such as yourself that is uh, just kind of entering the career stages of your life here, what obviously we're going to look forward into the industry and look forward into the future, but right now, what do you see as one of the most limiting factors in the agricultural industry? I don't think that there would be just one. Um So, I, you know, I guess to, to name off some of them, I think uh, having the, the interplay between policy and the economics of agriculture. Um, we're seeing right now that, you know, because of things like the environment, the prices of not all, commodity prices, especially for grain farmers on a year like this, is, is quite good. But uh, inputs and equipment, land is squeezing those margins on production ever thinner, right? Um, but at the same time, we are working in a space, a new space, that we have different pressures on us as an agriculture industry coming from uh, the way that consumers are demanding that they want their food to be produced through that uh, aligns with their values, but also in a way that um, mitigates climate change and also reduces our impact on climate change. And that's tricky. Uh, I, you know, I think that as it exists right now, the, the economics of farming and the demands from society don't really click. Um, and so making the policy to make, make those two pieces fit together, I think is a, is a real challenge, but it's something that with uh, working together with farmers and the consumers and also with scientists, we can help to solve, but it's not going to be easy. That's, uh, that's for sure. So things like carbon taxation um, and carbon credits for things like no-till, rotational grazing. You know, I'm, I'm not sure if that's something that you do with your goats, but I, you know, I think that, that's, uh, that we need to have the policies in place to promote that and so farmers can be recognized for those those positive practices that they do. So I'd say that would probably be in my mind, one of the the biggest challenges right now, you know, but there's always other ones like labor shortages. I think you mentioned that in the previous episode is, um, is something that I'm sure is very top of mind for folks working in production agriculture right now. Well, and it wouldn't be a challenge if it uh, was easily solvable. So uh, you're definitely not wrong there. But I don't want to leave it just on the limiting factors. Of course, I mean, agriculture is always changing. Every industry is always changing. But what are you most excited for in this industry? What sort of opportunities do you think we have going forward? Mm. Oh, I I think I I wouldn't... uh... I wouldn't be here if I didn't think that things were exciting. So, you know, I would say the uh, the trust that we can build in our own st- by telling our own stories, you know, and I've uh, seen this through, you know, different surveys than that that have come out that look at the really big picture, but also in talking to individual people, you know, um, society as a whole trusts farmers and they and they trust scientists from places like Ag Canada, like our universities and things like that. And so by, by telling the stories of, of what we do, um, I think that that has the opportunity to, to build trust, build good teams to solve those challenges that I was talking about earlier. Um, and I know that part's, you know, getting out there, it's, it, it sometimes, you know, can come across maybe as, uh, as gloating, as bragging, things like that. But I think by when we really get to know people, they understand that that's not the case. Uh, it's, there's things that are exciting. I love telling people about soil, about how forages help promote pollinators, uh, you know, seeing the nesting habitat that we have out in pastures and things like that, too. Um, and I think that we, by telling those stories, we can find a lot of common ground. And that, that's what really are what some of the things that get me excited to get up every morning and spend 10 hours out in the field measuring plants. 
And I like what you said about telling stories because there are so many interesting stories out there to tell. And I mean, hey, that's why we're here. But uh, I, another aspect of that too is listening. And I think we just, we need to listen to each other more, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. No, I was in preparation for this, uh, our conversation here today, I was writing those things down. I kind of, what are some of the things that uh, I think are really important to working in agriculture? And I wrote down communication, but communication is just as much listening as it is talking, right? Of, uh, you know, I, I've talked to many farmers and that, and, you know, being frustrated with the pressures from society and that, but um, yeah, of actually spending the time to listen where those frustrations come from, I think uh, it's helped me to realize that we have a lot more in common than we do uh, different. And that, that really helps to tackling some of those big issues sometimes. So what's next? Any ideas what uh, you're planning on doing after you defend your thesis, besides, of course, having a big celebration? Yeah. So uh, for now, I am. I, so I started spring of 2020, uh, hoping to uh, we'll be wrapping up field work about the week after Thanksgiving this year. And then hopefully I'll be able to, uh, depending on how fast I can write and uh, how little I procrastinate, uh, maybe defend in next spring. And then also at that same time, I'm going to be starting a position as a, a research agronomist with the Northeast Ag Research Foundation in Melfort, Saskatchewan. And um, so I'll be helping run their uh, research program there. And so it's a, a local applied research group. And so that'll be a little bit more uh, field crops focused than what I'm currently working on. But um, what gets me excited about that is the, no, I, I always love the hands-on aspect of research, being outside, seeing what actually what you're looking at and how it can make an impact for farmers. And then also the, the communications aspect. We get to hopefully work quite close with farmers, lots of field days, lots of conferences, uh, things like farm progress show and that. So I'm looking forward to being involved in more of those events going forward. Well, that is incredibly exciting. And I look forward to seeing how things go for you. And I'm sure we will talk to you again at some point. Good luck defending your thesis. Yeah, no, thank you, Kara. And thanks for the opportunity to have this uh, conversation here today. I'm glad we could to make something like this work. You bet. And thanks for all of you that tuned into episode four of The Successors. If you have any questions, comments, feedback, maybe you even know someone you think would make a great guest, get a hold of me. I am always open to new ideas and suggestions. So always, always appreciate that. You can do so by sending me a message on Twitter at Kara Oosterhouse or via email at koosterhouse at realagriculture.com. And for those of you wrapping up harvest, getting into fall run or whatever you may be doing, be safe out there, stay real. And thanks for listening to The Successors.